Hello and welcome to Tony Point Tactics, the competitive kill team 40k podcast, focused on giving you the strategies and tactics to seize initiative every turning point. I'm your host Ryan and I'm joined by the new Space Marine Heroes kill team, Strike Force Justian, to my intercession squad guide, Shelf Life, Connor. How are you doing, Stephen Connor? I'm good, thanks, Ryan. Right, let's not let's not jinx it because we have been there before, haven't we? And had the data slate drop straight after. But... <laughs> I, I can guarantee you, the second I start editing this bad boy, that team's going to hit the shelves with free rules and everyone's going to be like, in session squad, some into session squad and move on. They're not going to care about it and they're going to want to move to other things. But what I will say about that though, is that this team's a great entry team, right? So I, I do think, although the new shiny team might come out, I think a lot of people are going to want to keep playing this team because they're very, very reliable and very, very consistent. So what we have made for everyone that's listening to this um, or on YouTube watching it, if you have over 50 slides of really detailed kill team analysis. Um, and as always, you know, if you do have any questions during uh, the, the slide or during the listen, you, know, you can drop a comment below on YouTube. But there's also the Patreon where you can get loads of competitive tips at a, at a quite competitive price, I think. So that's another option for you there. So starting from the, the beginning, where would we be from any uh, in-session squad guide if we didn't start with an overview? So straight into it, we're going to look at their play style. So we have two main points here, aggressive and mobile. Now, why do I think they're aggressive? Well, they have a lot of very uh, melee effective op uh, operatives with their chainsaws and their double fights, which is really, really good. Um, and that's four or five damage. It's, it's effective and it's very good at killing horde and mid-range models. They also have a lot of double sheet built into their, their, their capability as well. And their bolt guns and bolt rifles are actually very, very efficient at killing people as well. So they're very, very good at playing an aggressive play style, getting up, removing enemy models, and taking the, the, you know, the, the, the activation advantage away from those horde teams. But they're also very mobile. So because they're three APL, they have the ability to move, dash, and shoot, or charge and fight, and they can cover quite a lot of distance quite quickly doing that. Which means they can be quite forgiving if you're slightly bad on your model placement or anything like that. To, to lean further into that, they also have a chapter tactic for that plus one inch move um, added to your regular move distance. This gives you longer charges or longer moves and shoots, and that can really catch people off guard and give you that little extra edge that you need to be able to get to the right position to get the shot that you need against your opponent. Now for the archetypes, they have access to two, seek and destroy and security. My baseline recommendation for you as advice is to play seek and destroy, but if you have a game plan that's that's around security, well then feel free to lean into it. But my my general take is that you want to take something that's going to be rewarding you for playing that aggressive mobile play style, and Seek and Destroy is going to do that. Finally, they are classed as an elite kill team as there are only six operatives. Connor, do you want to go into the, a bit of the analysis on the numbers of the, of the kill teams so people can see where we're at with that? Yeah, of course. So as you alluded to there, yes, this is an elite team. We've got six operatives which means six activations. Now, that is a little bit on the low side. I think on average, we'd be expecting to see about 10 for most kill team rosters for both operatives and activations there. Looking uh, at 18 action points, because as you said, there are three APL per man side, which is it's pretty close to average. We'd probably think about 20 APL on average for most teams and 85 to 91 wounds. I think we did do a little check earlier and most wounds are between like 75 and 95. So again, average amount of wounds when you look at it. But they do have that three plus save. So we've only got six guys, but they are six beefy guys when you think about it. And it's really interesting though, because because those 85 uh, to 90, 91 wounds is the way that you can get 91 with a certain chapter tactic. But those those generically 85 wounds are locked in those six operatives. So they can be quite risky to a, to a high damage spike, removing a high amount of wounds quite easily. Uh, whereas it's not dissipated, as you say, over a, say a 10 operative kill team, which is a bit easier to manage. Uh, what about the rest of their stats, Connor? You alluded again to just how lethal and killing these guys are with a double shoot, but they are good at shooting too. So they've got a three plus ballistic skill, but not afraid to get in combat as well with a three plus weapon skill. Now the weapons they have, they've got six armor piercing guns or 12 when you look at some of the AP that they can take as well. And then two blast weapons is, are available as well. Yes, it's really interesting because they can double shoot on paper. A lot of them having AP1 or P1 doesn't look there's actually that much AP on the team. But when you start seeing them double shoot repeatedly with potentially lethal five guns, actually that AP1 triggers a lot. So although it looks when you first look at the team like there's not that much AP floating around, actually when you play against an elite player and you start double tapping lethal five P1 bolts into them, they're going to notice that AP really rapidly. And you also have access to a plasma pistol, as you said, and crack grenades on both the grenade launcher and, um, and the hand thrown in direct ones. So actually... 12 AP is, is quite realistic with this team. 
But Blast, you only really have two access to that, and that's both in the, in the form of frag grenades. We'll, we'll cover those in a bit more detail later on, but but not the best, not the worst. Um, it, it's, it's not exciting, and it's not, it's not killing, it's just sort of wounding potential there. So if we roll into the strengths of this team, so I, I play this team quite a lot now, and I think I know roughly where their strengths and where their weaknesses lie. Um, primarily, they are a simple team to play. Okay, So what's really good is you have those 18 action points, but they're actually really efficient with them. So you're not often wasting action points. So with with Legionary, it might be that you can only shoot once per model. So you might be moving and dashing and shooting, but actually a lot of that's just movement potential and it's wasted. Um, and therefore you're not getting to, to fully use all your actions. Whereas you could potentially have a an incessor standing on a point, he's capturing the point, he's shooting twice, and all of that APL is being used in a really efficient, effective way, which is awesome for them as, as a kill team. They're actually pretty deadly. And we're going to get into some stats in a bit. But that's that's that comes a lot from, as you sort of said, their P1, their access to lethal five, their access to increased damage, but primarily their rerolls. They have so many ways of getting rerolls, and they're so effective with getting their rerolls as well. And all their melee operatives have five attacks. They're sort of dedicated melee operatives. So they have a, a really good reliability in actually killing enemies so long as you're in the correct doctrine. So there is a, a, a huge part of this team is making sure you select the right range to be engaging your enemies at to use that reroll system effectively. They're also very durable, right? So each individual incessor is surprisingly hard to take down. And everyone thinks that they're going to be able to chip through these guys with only six models. But actually, you'd be surprised at how much they, they, they can stand up to some quite effective enemy fire. And then they have a huge comeback potential, right? So even if you're left with just two models on the board, that can still be enough to deal a significant amount of damage to an opponent. There's so many times where I've lost a model early on, I've lost two models early on, and I think to myself, I am out of this game. But actually... You can come right back. You just keep playing methodically, keep uh, you know, working on effectively scoring points, effectively killing your enemies, denying their VP, and you'll be amazed at how quickly this team can come back on turns three and turns four, which is really awesome. And finally, they're really good at points denial. So elite teams in general are very, very hard to kill, which then means that for seek and destroy, it can be very hard to secure against them. But they're also very good at uh, sitting in the middle and having three APL on objectives to so deny security, deny recon attack ops, and that kind of thing as well. So they're really, really good at denying your opponent's attack ops, but that requires you to have a really good knowledge of what your opponent is trying to score to be able to then use your models effectively to be able to do that. But there is some weaknesses. So we sort of talked about this already, there are only six um, models, and you will start feeling those those casualties as each one comes in. Now, as I said, you, you can still come back and you can still do a lot of damage with each operative, but as soon as you lose a model, it really hurts you. And the difference between having a model on one wound and having a model on 14 wounds is, is, is basically is irrelevant. But as soon as they're dead and incapacitated, that is a massive blow to your team because if they're methodical and they're rapid, they're still doing everything you need them to do, even with just one wound remaining. Now, they also really don't like high armor piercing uh, uh, weapons, such as plasma, which is like high damage, melty guns, that sort of stuff. They don't have many, uh, they don't have any access to invulnerable saves. Um, and therefore, if you can use that high AP weapon against them, it can really cut through them very, very efficiently. Um, the other thing that doesn't really help with this is if your opponent has a tendency to roll very hot, all right? So there is there is not much in the game that, that you, you can do if your opponent has a ridiculously hot roll and you roll really badly and suddenly that las gunner has has somehow killed your your intercessor who who's you know at 12 wounds or whatever with four crits and, and you make no saves something like that would be would be really bad and finally what i say about this team as well is they are so common like Everyone has seen intercession. Everyone knows about them. They know the rules. I know the stats. And there's nothing too much about there that, that's going to catch them off guard, right? So people aren't going to be like, oh, I, I never saw you being able to do this. So they are quite predictable to play against. Um, and your opponent has almost certainly done prep games against intercession or played as them themselves. So they probably know your attack ops. They probably know your models. They know your profiles. They know what it is you're trying to do. All right, so that's the, 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 the generic problem. But what I will say is, overall... I think they're a really good team and they have a lot of um, a lot of pros going for them. And we're going to roll into a bit more detail now on, on, onto the team, looking at some of their chapter tactics. So there's three that I think are your standard chapter tactics that you want to go to every game. Rapid, methodical, and durable. So Connor, you, you haven't played too much of, of, of In Session, so I'm going to sort of just roughly go through what these three uh, do. So rapid is going to give you an extra inch to your movement which is really, really useful for that mobile uh, place that I talked about earlier. Methodical means you're going to ignore all um, 
ne uh, negative modifiers to your weapon skill and your ballistic skill. Note there's some that will still affect you, such as the Gallipox ability to make you be, be permanently injured. That would still work. Um, but for most of the cases, if you're injured and that sort of stuff, you're not going to care. This is really good for your durability. And durable means that you can now uh, ignore one crit uh, damage. Or I say ignore it. You uh, reduce the damage of it by uh, by one to a minimum of three. So it can it can affect the break point of a lot of weapons against you, such as power weapons um, or, or or stuff like that. However, it it got nerfed in the last balance data slate. I don't think it's quite as good as it is anymore, but it still has a place, right? It's it's still useful. But I think the two that you want to be leaning on most commonly is going to be your rapid and your methodical. They always come into effect and they are so, so useful. And you have uh, some strat ploy which can help you with a durable one should you need to. They all do have a bunch of other chapter tactics though, um, and they're a bit more niche, niche choices. So they have aggressive, jeweler, raider, stealthy, and accurate. They also have mobile, hardy, and unyielding. These are the ones that I would say, you know, you have to have a plan for. I'm not going to go into detail on them. You can, you can read them online. It's a free PDF. I'm not here to just read rules at you. But in my opinion, I think they're a bit of a niche take. And I, and I don't think that you should be basing your list on them. And Deadly Sharpshooter is, is one that I think you should never, ever consider taking as it, it, it doesn't really apply uh, any, any logical sense unless you're fighting, say, Talons of the Emperor. But building a, a roster choice based on one enemy kill team alone is which is a companion team, is probably uh, not, not the best of choices. Okay, finally then, I think we'll just have a quick look over what the optives are, all right? So you have two options when it comes to the sergeant. You either take the intercessor sergeant or the assault intercessor sergeant. Now, with the intercessor sergeant, you have access to three weapons, but there's only two that you really care about, the auto bolt rifle and the bolt rifle. And you're always pretty much going to take the power weapon. This one, in my opinion, is your perfect model to fight mid-range and horde so you can take the auto bolt rifle which is going to give you ceaseless and reroll ones or the bolt rifle which is going to give you p1 um, but note this guy is hitting on twos anyway now generically ceaseless and hitting on twos is really really good if you're not going to be in your doctrine but if you are in a doctrine actually how many ones do you think you're going to roll right so you shouldn't be rolling that many on, on, on attack where you're hitting on twos so actually the bolt rifle generically is the better choice and the power weapon is really good at being able to defend yourself against other targets. Now you'll see here that there's also a little caveat, right? When I'm going to talk about elite. And I think that's because there's a little bit of play here where actually in some matchups, specifically when we're looking at it, it's going to be Phobos and Nurgle Legionary, where I think maybe you don't take the plasma pistol, which sounds pretty nuts, but there is some justification to it later on in, this, in the numbers. But the, the default pick... Um, is, is going to be auto bolt rifle against with a power weapon against your mid-range and your horde. But I say, if you want to be a bit more experimental and, and, and you're a bit more uh, advanced at the game, start looking to take that bolt rifle and start looking to take this guy into more matchups because he really is very valuable. The Assault Incessor Sergeant then, I think you always take him with Plasma Pistol and Chainsword. And he is your standard counter elite meta uh, killer. But the problem is his Plasma Pistol only hits on threes, but it is a Plasma Pistol, so it is quite good. But there are some matchups where maybe it isn't quite as good as, as, as you would first think, particularly against models that feel no pains, models that have 13 wounds and the Nurgle minus one damage, something like that, that could leave you with a little bit of a feels bad. Okay, so we covered off the, um, the, the leaders and then into some of the auto-includes. So generically, I think there are two auto-includes on your list, um, and that's going to be your Intercessor Gunner. This is the guy that's armed with... Uh, the auxiliary grenade launcher and he's pretty much a take all comers at all times i don't know a matchup where i wouldn't take this operative um when it comes to which weapon choice to give him you have three options the auto bolt rifle the bolt rifle and the stalker bolt rifle and the reason why the stalker bolt rifle is on here is because you often find yourself um using this model to overwatch or using this model um, in a shoot action where he, he is either standing still or having only done a dash. And that comes down to a piece of equipment, the ore specs, we'll talk about later on as well. But that means that he has access to AP1 on two of his weapons, and that can be really, really good at putting down some hurt against some armored targets or guaranteeing some kills. But he is pretty much a take-all comers. And the Assault Incessor Grenadier is the Assault Incessor that comes for free with frag and crack grenades. Um, he also has a bolt pistol and chainsaws. I think generically you're always going to take this guy. I think there's one niche case potentially against Pathfinders where maybe switching him out could be worthwhile, but generically this guy is a is a take all comers. 
And then finally, you have the intercessor, the regular one, and the assault intercessor. Now here you can have the auto bolt rifle or bolt rifle and fists. Um, and note that I've sort of excluded the stalker bolt rifle. Paying the heavy penalty on these guys is not going to be worth it. You don't want to be doing it. It's too restrictive for the movement that you need this team to be able to do. And note that I'm trying to play with that rapid and that um, methodical play style. So I really want to make full, full use of that movement buff. So if I'm only using three inches with a dash, that's no use to me at all. So I want to be using either the auto bolt rifle or the bolt rifle. And generally, I'm always going to lean towards the bolt rifle because personally, as a player, I think I've figured out which doctrine to be in most of the time. And therefore, I'm going to be getting the maximum use out of those rerolls. I don't need the ceaseless rerolls the auto bolt rifle is going to give me. And it's going to give me a better percentage chance to kill. But we'll come on to that again later. Finally, we have the assault intercessor armed with the bolt pistol and the chainsword. And this is going to be quite controversial because I'm going to say this guy is slightly more niche. So I'm going to say generically, guys, you want to lean into shooting with these this team. They're far, far better at shooting than they are at melee. But, you know, there are scenarios where actually the Assault Incessor is a really good pick. But I'm just saying, think about it before you take him. And if you're like erring on the side of caution, probably lean towards the Incessor. They're easier to play. They're more applicable and they're more widespread against a, a, a better variety of teams as being a better matchup. So that's kind of my uh, main thoughts on that. Connor, as a as a basic overview of the team, any thoughts that you have on that, or anything that you think's worth uh, highlighting? No, I love I love what you've um, you said so far. One thing I would say, um, we are going back to where we said this is an elite team, six models. I think we can agree that is that is a disadvantage. But one thing I would say is it does present the opportunity for Overwatch, which can be good against horde teams. So if if you're cunning or quite clever, you can actually get more than your six activations because you can sneak in some uh, some overwatch shooting as well oh absolutely and we're going to talk about some tactics that you can do with elite teams in a bit uh, and that is a hundred percent a way that you have to min max your elite team usage is you have to look at that overwatch which again is why i put such a high value on that methodical ability because that methodical ability means your overwatch is going to be on threes even if you're overwatching and you're injured you're still hitting on threes and that is so critical to how elite teams play and win effectively. So, kind of generically, I think a lot of um, uh, standard content creators m might just end it there and say, you know, that was that was the, the overview of the team. But we're obviously going to go into a lot more detail because I think that's kind of our, our main selling point on Turning Point Tactics. But to do that has required a significant amount of investment from us, probably. Um, you know, I've, <laughs> I've been making this slide deck for, for a while. Um, I've, I've gone to probably like four or five tournaments with this team to learn the team. Um, get the details of them and, and understand how they perform um, and, and played you one too many times with your, your legionaries and um, <laughs> have, have, been, have been hurt doing it. So if someone's out there and, and they want to try and support us um, to be able to make more of these, so if, let's say for legionary or for other uh, teams like Vet Guard, Navy Breaches or something like that, is there any way that they, they could go about supporting the, this podcast? Yeah, there is. So for as little as £3 a month, they could join our, our Patreon, which would obviously help us get towards getting that strike force justin team and hopefully build another guide like this but for you that would get you uh, access to our members only discord which is our new discord that we've created recently and i love the community on there it's really nice engaging people there as well as access to our priority q a so we can ask you questions and get your questions answered on the show as well you'll get early access to all of our content and some special patreon exclusive content as well if you're on YouTube, you could consider liking and subscribing. And it's we're really grateful for the amount of people that have done that already. I think we're we're over 800. I think looking uh, recently, it's just phenomenal the support we've seen there. And don't forget to add your comments and thoughts into the videos too. And finally, if you're now looking at this team, thinking I want to buy an intercessor team, consider buying it from Eloquent Games using our affiliate link in the description. They offer a, a discount of about 10, 15 percent, and we'll get support that way if you buy through them too. Absolutely. And it's you know it's, it's that little bit of payback that just helps us keep this the show ticking over and increase the uh, the, the quality every time. Okay, moving in then. So the way that we've done this is we've addressed some some baselines. Now we're going to give you a whole load of stats and numbers and that sort of stuff, and that's fine. We're not going to talk through all of them because there's there's too many. But what you'll notice is they've been set against a baseline, and the reason why we've done this is because. There is, there is like an infinite number of variables that you can have in any game of Kill Team, right? And us giving you a thousand slides or an Excel spreadsheet that's 20,000 uh, cells long isn't going to be usable or, or, or helpful for anyone, okay? So what we've done is we've established these baselines. Now, generically, 
they don't ha- they don't account for any strategic ploys or any tactical ploys, all right? So if you have something that makes your team more durable or uh, lets you rerolls, makes it more offensive, it's not going to have accounted for that. Uh, for the defensive profile of these kill teams, it's going to be assumed that they're always going to be in cover because that's kind of like a worst case scenario. And it also means that when we do this in future, we can see the benefit you're going to get from those weapons that potentially give you no cover and remove that auto retain. For the melee profile, we've just selected the most common weapon route we think those operatives are going to be armed with, and we'll go through those shortly so you can see. And for the common shooting profiles, when we look at this team's durability, we've compared them to the weapon systems that I think that you'll see most commonly on the board. So a las gun, a bolt rifle, a crack grenade, and a plasma gun. And I think those are sort of the the, the basic idea of, of what you're going to see. So you see something that's AP1, something that's AP2, and something that's P1, and something that's a bit, you know, a sort of a chaff weapon that you might see commonly uh, on the field. So Let's look at the um, the, the horde baseline, Connor. What, what what numbers have we got for this? Yeah, so looking at horde, uh, we're thinking of a seven wound model with a five plus save. They get three di- uh, three defense dice and they retain one for cover. In melee, they're going to have three attacks with a four plus weapon skill, doing two three damage, and again, like we said, seven wounds. Sounds like a pretty standard guardsman. Yeah, I think. Yeah, your, your guardsman, your pathfinder. That that's what we're thinking basically. Ideal mid range. So this is basically going to be Eldar or equivalent and we're looking again at eight wounds with a four up save three defense dice and they retain one for cover and in melee you're going to have four attacks with a three plus weapon skill doing four to six damage and probably lethal five and they've got eight wounds as I said before uh, a brute baseline this is going to be like your commandos or maybe even the new felgor that have just turned up those sneaky uh, sneaky, sneaky t- beastmen sneaky, sneaky beastmen exactly these guys have got 10 wounds a five up save uh, again, three defense and one auto retain. And in melee, we're looking at four attacks with a three plus weapon skill, doing four, five damage and 10 wounds. Uh, your elites, so this is your space marines. We've got 12 wounds, three plus save, three defense, retaining one. And in combat, five attacks, three plus weapon skill, doing four, five damage, 12 wounds. Ideal. So when we talk about this in future podcasts as well, we'll, we'll flip these these back up so people can refresh themselves. But this is what we're talking about, right? So when we're talking about the fact that they're going to be good at killing brutes, or they're going to be good at killing elites, or whatever it's going to be, you know, this might be your mid-range slayer. That's kind of what we're getting at, right? So look at it f- from those perspectives. That's the generic profile that we have. Now remember, if you had, say, like Nurgle Legionaries, you have to apply that minus one damage. And that might affect quite a lot of, of the weapon breakpoints. We've kind of tried to do some of that analysis for you anyway and note that for instance like bolt rifles and bolt weapons like that with the minimum damage of three now a lot of them's not not that affected but always keen to remember that there is a little bit of a further analysis that you can do if you're tweaking it to, to a specific team that you're going against okay how we've done the analysis then we've kind of just gone for a traffic light system and i think this is the easiest way to try and do it so that everyone can understand where we're at right so green is obviously a good thing right so you're going to expect to kill them with your shooting attack on the melee attack you're definitely going to expect to, to wound them and you're going to win that melee combat that's a pretty good indication that it's going to go well for you yellow is going to be that you shouldn't expect to kill that model but you should be expecting to wound them okay so you'll survive the melee you'll you'll wound your enemy but you, you won't be getting a kill is kind of the way to, to, to look at it. And red is going to be, you're not going to be getting a kill against that model and you're not expecting to wound them either. And if you go into melee with them, you're probably going to lose. So that's the sort of the traffic light system. If you see something green, that's good. You're expecting to kill them, expecting to wound them. You're going to wound that melee. And if yellow, you're only going to be wounding them. You're, going to, you're just going to be surviving. And red, you're going to lose. You're probably going to die yourself in melee and you're not going to get a wound and you're not going to get a kill. Okay. Straight into the, the the stats then. So looking at the first and the most primary weapon that you're going to see incessors use. And you'll see down here on the left-hand side, we've got the ballistic skill. We've got what rerolls they have available and how many times that they're going to do that shoot action against a specific model, right? So note the double tap means that they're using both their shoot actions against a singular model. Right, horde then. So generically, if you're shooting on 3+, plus with no rerolls, you only have a 32.48% chance to kill. But you are expecting to wound right so you'll do 4.56 damage and wound them note this reads across exactly the same to mid-range you'd expect to wound but only a 14 percent chance to kill but with brutes you're not expecting to wound you're not expecting to kill and elites the same not expecting to wound and not expecting to kill now this is where i talk about dice don't kill people but dice with re-rolls do we can see the effect of adding a doctrine here this is a single balance re-roll on your uh, your shooting attack that your probability to kill against a horde model is going to go up to 49%. That's actually pretty likely. 
Um, and it has a six average damage of six, which is really, really good. So you're expecting to wound them and you're actually expecting to kill them most of the time. Against mid range, you're probably not going to pick up that kill. That four plus armor save is slightly too uh, difficult to cut through, but you are expecting now to, to, to reliably wound them with an average damage of 5.5. Against brutes, the same can be said. Your, your chance to kill is actually pretty low. Just 10 wounds is just too much to chew through. But you are expecting now to wound them, which is a big increase on the previous. And remember, this is only a single shooting attack. Finally, against elites, you're not going to kill them with a 1% chance of killing, but and your expected damage is going to be 4.96, so you're not expecting to wound them anyway. But let's see what happens when we start double tapping them and the effect of that we're going to have when we use that, that two actions and when we have the doctrine uh, applied as well. So a double tap against a horde model goes up to 70.69%. That's expected damage of 9. That's a really high chance you're going to kill that model. Mid-range, again, 49.47%. The expected damage of 8. So you're expecting to kill them on damage or at least wound them uh, going through. Against brutes, it's now up to 48.58% chance. It's actually pretty reliable with a 9.13% uh, uh, damage. And finally, 15% uh, against an elite with expected damage of 7. So now actually with two shooting attacks, you're going to start to see them actually get wounded. Finally, the most uh, effective profile you're going to see is going to be the Doctrine Up with Double Tap. 87.24% chance to kill a Horde model with expected damage of 12.26. That's huge. That's really, really good for this team. Against mid-range, 73.60, expects damage of 11.07. And against a Brute, 72.89, expects damage of 12. That's really, really good. You're expecting to get kills against most of these models with a double tap um, and the Doctrine up. Finally, against Elites, 35.6% chance with a 9.91 uh, damage. This is actually much better than people are initially going to think about. So... That means if you have six incestors on your, on, your, on your kill team and they all double tap, you're going to kill two enemy models each turn. That's really, really good. Right? That, that is actually a good stat based on what you have. But note that also you can sp spread that damage out. And if one of your attack rolls spikes, you're going to get significantly more. And note, we haven't included here any equipment. Let's go to the next pick, though. Let's go to the auto bolt rifle. Um, so against a horde model, 37.18, five damage. Against mid-range, 15, 4 damage. Against a brute, 11%, 5 damage. And against an elite, 0.38%, no real chance, uh, 3 damage. As you get into that doctrine, though, it's going to start getting more reliable, up to 47.97. Uh, and uh, against mid-range, 21.94. Against a brute, 18.4. And against elite, only 4.5 damage with a 0.5% chance to kill. So noting you're actually going to start wounding people more reliably, and you have a chance to kill some of those models. When you get into the double tap and the doctrine double tap, you're going to see those, those numbers increase. 79 against a horde model, expects damage of 10 on a double tap. When you use a doctrine, it goes up to 89% and 12 damage. Against mid range, it's going to be 56% chance, 8.8 .8 damage with a doctrine and double tap, 73 with expected damage of 10. Against brutes, 59% uh, chance to kill. Expected damage up to 10.43. And with the double tap with the Doctrine, 74.93%. Expected damage of 12. So that's going to slay those Orcs and those um, uh, Beastmen. But against Elites, you're looking at less damage um, with this versus the uh, Elites than the Bolt Rifle, the P1, with um, a 14% chance to kill. Expected damage 7.6, sorry, 2.6. And a 25% chance to kill with the, with the Doctrine. Expected damage 8.6. Nine, nine. So that's lower than the 9.91 that we were seeing and about a 10% chance less chance to kill with the Doctrine double tap uh, than versus the uh, bolt rifle. Finally, we'll look at the Stalker bolt rifle just to give you guys the stats. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail on this, but just to show you that it is better um, and you do have a much higher chance to kill. However, it does come tagged with that heavy keyword. So always apply a bit of a caveat to this uh, in the sense that you might not be able to get the shot at all. So if you're not getting the shot, then that let's, let's say the best case scenario against an elite model with a Doctrine and Double Trap, that's 11.18 damage that you haven't done because you haven't been able to shoot at all. But you'll see here that across the board, it's it's very reliable at killing um, with most percentages. Uh, well, so against a Horde model with Double Tap Doctrine, 90% chance to kill. Against Midrange, 82% chance to kill. Against a Brute, 78% chance to kill. And against Elite, 47.49% chance to kill. Now, what I will again remind you all, this obviously gets a lot better if we um, if we get up to, uh, sorry, if we remove their cover or we shoot a model that's not in cover. 
Okay, just for interest then, because people will want to see how this uh, stacks on other models, you also have the Assault Intercessor. Now you've obviously got the Bolt Pistol and the Crack Grenade. So shown here, you can see what the forecast damage is going to be with those, um, those weapons. So against a Horde model, just a 32% chance to kill with a 4.56 uh, chance of wound without your Doctrine, rising to 49% chance with the Doctrine and a 6.1 uh, average damage. Against mid-range, 14% chance to kill without your Doctrine with expected damage of 4, so you are expecting to wound. And with the Doctrine up, that's going to go up to 27% chance with expected damage of 5.54. So basically, what you're looking at from this is you can start to expect to reliably wound these models, but not kill anything apart from a, a Horde model uh, with with the bolt pistol against brutes it's down to 9.5 uh, percent chance to kill expected damage of 4.56 and with doctrine it's only going to rise to 21 percent chance with expected damage of six and against an elite model very low chance to kill 0.59 percent chance with a three plus 3.5 damage and a, and a chance of one one percent uh, with the doctrine up with an average damage of 4.96 so really not that good chances now let's look at the crack grenade, because I think crack grenade is a really interesting one. Where everyone seems to think that this is going to reliably kill any model on the board whenever they throw it. But actually, if we look at the stats, you're going to see that it's not maybe not quite as reliable as you first think. Against a horde model, it seems pretty good. So against horde, 48.46% chance, expected damage of 6.36. And if you have your doc doctrine, that's going to go up to 69% nice percent chance to kill with an average damage of 8.41. Um Against your mid-range, it's going to start at 42.59% with an expected damage of 5.83, rising to 64.87% chance with an expected damage of 7.83 uh, with the Doctrine. Against the Brutes, though, the math doesn't seem to look quite so good, and that's because the base damage 4 is going to be difficult with like, that 10 wound breakpoint. So it goes down to a 19.7% chance to kill, uh, with, uh, rising to a 37% chance with the Doctrine, an average damage of 6, rising to 8 uh, there. And against Elites... Your crack grenade without any rerolls only has a 7.3% chance to kill with expected damage of 5.3. And even with the rerolls, that rises to 16% chance with expected damage of 7. So something for you guys to consider when, when you're moving these guys in and throwing crack grenades at an elite model is you don't actually have a very statistically high chance to kill anyone at all. Okay. Whew, that's quite a lot of numbers, but we're going to keep pushing through. Money. Now, there's a lot of numbers, but what I do think is important is people actually understand where teams are and what their chances are. And remember, these will be available as a PDF on the Patreons. So if people want to go back and look through them in slow time, they can get all those available to them uh, at, at, at a moment's notice. Okay, frag grenades then. So this is the, the, the main point that I, I want to draw from frag grenades. I'm not actually going to read through all of these because you, you're going to see here that there is basically no chance with a frag grenade in the open that you're going to do anything better than chip damage. So the best prob probability of kill you have is with the grenade launcher at 20.27% when it has its doctrine up, right? That is not good odds of killing someone. So the main thing I'm going to say to you guys is if you're using frag grenades, expect chip damage. Maybe against a horde model, you might just be able to wound them um, with an expected damage of 4.43, but against the rest, it's just going to be chip. It gets a little bit better when you talk about Into the Dark, though, because that lethal 5 is going to apply a little bit more damage to these people. And what I'll, what I'll take away from this is, is against Horde models with the, um, the Frag Grenade, Frag Launcher, um, either with the Doctrine up or not, you're expecting to get a wound, and that can be said again with the Doctrine, with the Frag Grenade and Frag Launcher, your wound mid-range, and you'll only wound the Brutes with the Frag Launcher uh, in Doctrine. Everyone else is going to be chip damage. So just remind yourself, if you're going to be shooting these things at groups of enemies, you're probably only ever going to get wounded, uh, wounds and you're not going to get kills. A good thing to remind yourself. Unless, of course, that group is already wounded. If only there was a way, Connor, for us to be able to shoot more than one Frag Grenade at a target. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> okay. So let's talk about the sergeant loadouts then, because this is the the, the main debate, right? And there's, there's a whole episode that we talk about where I talk about uh, reject plasma, embrace bolter, and, and, and you can see the, the, the reasons why. But I want to go through some of the numbers and people can then see why I'm saying that and why I think it's really important. Okay, so the plasma pistol sergeant then. So he has two options, AP1 or AP2, and he has the ability to uh, use a doctrine or not. Um, AP1 against a Horde model, 48.46% chance to kill, which is pretty good, with an expected damage of 7.81. Now, if obviously if he has the reroll, that goes up to 69% chance, nice, with an expected damage of 10.34. Uh, 
If you were then overcharged that and go to AP2 with the reroll, you're looking at 80% chance to kill on expected damage of 11.97. Without the, uh, the reroll, you're looking at a 61% chance with an average damage of 9.3. Now, there is a little caveat to this. If you use the overcharge and you don't have a reroll, there is a 51.77% chance you take at least, at least three mortal wounds, and it could be worse than that. With the reroll, that lowers to 19.62% chance to take at least three mortal wounds. So just be aware with this guy that every time you shoot this weapon, it's probably going to cost you three mortal wounds um, or on a coin flip, uh, unless you have a doctrine up. And if you don't, then that's going to be really, really painful for you and it might ruin your break point of your damage. Okay, next thing we're going to look at, mid-range. AP1, hitting on threes, no re-rolls, 42% chance. With the re-rolls, goes up to 64% chance. Uh, average damage going from 7 up to 9. So you're not going to kill them if, unless you use the Doctrine against a mid-range or unless you overcharge, where it's going to go from uh, hitting on threes, AP2, goes to 61% chance with expected damage of 9.3, rising with that re-roll to an 80% chance to kill with expected damage of 11.97. Against Brutes... Hitting on threes, AP1, 48% chance to kill. Expected damage of 7.8. Hitting on threes, AP1, with the Doctrine, 69, nice. Expected damage, 10. AP2, no rerolls, 61. With rerolls, 80%. Really, really good increase. And against elites, it's going to start at AP1 at 12% chance to kill. With rerolls rising to 24. At AP2, 27% chance to kill. With rerolls rising to 52% chance to kill. Now, that's really interesting because we're going to switch now and look at the bolt rifle. So, note, you had a 20% chance to take some mortal wounds when using that plasma pistol, overcharging against uh, your, your enemy. If you double tap with Doctrine, hitting on twos, P1, no lethal five, no increased damage, you have a 59.73% chance to kill against a elite model in cover. Now, big caveat here, obviously, you know, this is a two shoot actions versus one shoot action, all that sort of stuff. But what I would say is that because this is infinite range, you potentially have more options to be able to get that um, and be able to, to, to use that shoot option where, where you can. So I'm, I'm just going to say to people, like, you know, don't rule out the bolt rifle sergeant. If you get to shoot twice against one of these models, there is a good chance that you're going to kill them with 59% chance. And not just that, but there's also the ability that you're, um, you're not going to take any mortal wounds as a result. And that can be really, really critical when they're coming at you with four damage weapons with your break points. Okay, um, let's look into the, the rest of the stats just quickly. Against a, a horde model, you're going to expect to um, injure them uh, unless you have the reroll where you expect to kill. With double taps, you're going to expect to kill any horde model uh, either way. At really high odds if you uh, have the doctrine up as well. Against mid range, you're expecting to wound unless you double tap, where then you're going to expect to kill. And against brutes, you expect to wound unless you double tap, where then you're going to expect to kill. Interestingly, with the uh, the against elites, you're only going to wound them if you have the doctrine or if you double tap, but you would expect to kill them if you both double tap with the doctrine. Really interesting stats. For awareness, a little bit of comparison, you do have the auto bolt, right, uh, auto bolt rifle, uh, and you can see there with the ceaseless ability, generic stats are all the same. You can compare, it's a little bit better against the Horde models, it's worse against the Elite models, and it sits somewhere in between in the middle. Um, but this is where I talk about the, the, the value of, of, of the Doctrine. As you can see there, with the Doctrine and the double tap up, you're going to be much more reliably killing the, the main models. So that's kind of like a, a down to you. I think personally, if you're able to sit in those Doctrine ranges, I like the access to P1, the slightly higher chance to kill, but maybe that's just me. Um, but you, you, you can take away from that what you will with a bit more flex there. Okay, Stalker Bolt Rifle, no surprises here. It's really, really good. It's better than all the others. It comes with Heavy. Um, I you know, personally think Heavy is too much for a penalty, but if, if you think you can move around it, fair enough. But what I will say is against a good opponent, a competent opponent, they're going to be really good at understanding where your threat ranges lie and they're going to move outside of that. And that can really hamstring you uh, in, in that matchup. But the data is there uh, on the YouTube video for anyone that needs it, or if you're listening, I said it's, it's on the, the Patreon on, on the PDF pictures. Okay, let's look at some melee analysis then, because I think this is a a, a commonly um, overlooked thing. People will, will think they're far more better than they they are, or far worse than they are. 
So what I've looked at here is an attacker profile where the attacker is trying to do maximum damage and the defender is trying to minimize the damage to them so you can see how, how likely you are to do damage. Um, I've looked at the fists, the combat blade, the chainsaw, and the power weapon. And the, the interesting trends that I would say that come out of this is the combat blade really doesn't help you against anyone um, other than the mid-range and the brutes, where it's going to give you a slight buff. Um, but the five damage really doesn't help you too much against any, either the horde models or the elite models. Um, the Obviously, the power weapon is what's available on your sergeant, and the chainsaw is available for everyone else. Uh, so all of these are hitting on threes. I said, if you want to look into some more analysis with it, the more hits on twos, uh, you can do that by looking, following that link with the um, the kill team calculator because that's where I got all this data and it's really, really helpful and it's available to you all there. Um, so generically though, uh, if you attack a horde model, you have a 44% chance to kill them um, with expected damage of 5.45 with fists. With a combat blade, it's exactly the same, 44% chance, but your average damage is going to go up a little bit to 5.58. Chainsword is going to go up to 81.54 uh, with expected damage of 6.5. Power weapon down to 66.32 with expected damage of 6.3. So not terrible on the power weapon, not terrible on the chainsword, but you're only really expecting to wound with fists and combat blades. Against mid-range, this gets a lot worse. Your fists, you're only expecting to kill on a 6% uh, 6 chance at the time with 5 damage average. This does get better if you have the combat blade because it's going to go up to 37% chance. That's why I say it's really useful to have it there where actually the, the five damage puts them in potentially a two-hit range if you can roll a crit. With the chainsword, you're up to 79% chance with expected damage of 7.24 and the power weapon, 61% chance to kill. Against brutes, uh, with your fists, 2% chance to kill, expected damage of five. Combat blade, 8% chance to kill, expected damage of six. And your chainsword, 24% chance to kill, expected damage of eight. Now, noticing here, if you're fighting against beastmen, you only have a 24% chance to kill each time you fight them, and you're expecting to do 8 damage, and they're probably going to do some damage back to you as well. This is really, really grim when we look at how uh, durable these guys can be to, uh, to, to offensive action. The power weapon, though, a little bit better against those brutes with that lethal 5 and 6 damage, with a 57% chance to kill, expected damage of 8. Against elites, pretty much all of these look bad, to be honest. So... Your fists have a 0.76% uh, chance to kill with an expected damage of 5. Your combat blade, 0.92, expected damage of 5.97. Your chainsaw, only a 15% chance to kill with expected damage of 8. And your power weapon has a 23% chance to kill with expected damage of 8. So again, in this scenario, when you're charging a sort incessor into a legion read, just understand that you have a really low probability to kill on that first fight action. It's probably going to take you two, and you're going to take quite a lot of damage in, re in return. Okay. So that was all the numbers, and that's a, that's a whole lot of data that's probably a lot to process, and people can skip over it or go back to it, look into more detail if they want to. But what's my, my competitive advice when it comes to that weapon summary? So I personally think the bolt rifle is the best choice most of the time. Against mid-range and elite, it is fantastic, and the Vengeance class scope is going to make it even better. The auto bolt rifle is really, really good against hordes, and particularly if you're not in the right doctrine, but... If you can manage that doctrine range and get yourself in the right doctrine where you where, where possible, then it's going to be um, it's going to be much be be more beneficial to potentially use the bolt rifle. But the stalker bolt rifle is there as an option. As I said, the big caveat to that is that heavy keyword that's going to really slow you down moving around the map. Um, but you know it's it, it's there as an option. But unless you have a specific game plan for it, I'd say probably leave it at home. Con, I've talked a lot about the weaponry. Do you want to cover some of the detail on on the durability of the kill team? So we've uh, yeah sure. So we've talked a lot about dishing damage out, but what about when they try to dish damage onto us? Well, luckily we're the Empress Finest and we are good at deflecting damage. So if we look at say our average warrior caught in the open, if he starts taking fire from a las gun from say a horde model, he's not going to die. He's going to get chip damage at best, expected damage, 1.55, probability of death, 0%. From a bolt rifle, okay, probability of dying, now it's half a percent, and expected chip damage of 4.18, and even a crack grenade, the probability of dying is really only 5.18%, uh, with expected damage of 6.3. And then again, if they actually bring out a big beefy plasma gun to try and deal with you, still only a 33% chance that they're going to kill you in the open with an expected damage of 10.75. That's how tough we are. The sergeant, obviously, he's got an extra wound. So really similar similar odds because of those break points. I won't repeat them. But if you manage to 
position correctly and you've got your model in cover that damage is now going way down so again the last gun is just going to chip at 1.25 the bolt rifle we're looking at 3.52 damage and now only a 0.03 percent chance to kill us that crack grenade it was at five it's now looking at 2.44 percent to kill you and only 5.3 percent expected damage and that plasma gun goes way down to 20.37 percent chance with an expected damage of 9.31 and the same is true for the sergeant as well so this is really interesting because like, obviously this is this is about re-rolls but a good thing to put in your in your head right even a plasma gun hitting on threes if your model's in cover it only has a 20 percent chance to kill and if your model's out of cover it still only has a 33 percent chance to kill but it is going to wound you you are going to get wounded from it but that's a really good mental thing to have in your head is that it can sometimes seem really scary when these guns are shooting at you, but unless they have some sort of reroll mechanic or some auto retain mechanic, some way of making that more reliable, it's actually not that bad. And that's that's plasma hitting on threes, overcharging against against one of your models. That's really interesting to see. And that's with no that's with no reroll, is it with the plasma? Yeah, that is with no rerolls. Yeah. So it is it is better odds if you reroll. I think it goes up to about fifty percent chance, but it's still not guaranteed, right? So I, th- I think that's a really interesting point for people to take take away is that those fourteen wounds, that damage break point, can be really difficult for a lot of weapons, even the, the four or five damage crack grenades and that sort of thing. Okay, so let's look at some equipment, um, and uh, and what the team can take. So the team can take some various bits. You know, it can take the vengeance class scope, which is going to give it lethal five. It can take the Reclusian Blessed Bolt, which is going to increase the damage from 3-4 up to 4-5. It can take an Awe Spect, which is going to let you ignore obscurity and also uh, remove your ability, your opponent's ability to retain cover saves from cover. They can also take the Tilting Shield, which is going to affect your ability, your opponent's ability to, in melee, uh, get crits or auto-retain crits through things such as uh, Rending. And then you also have the Combat Blade, which is going to give you an extra damage and a critical hit in melee as well. Finally, the Purity Seal, the Frag Grenade, and the Crack Grenade. The Purity Seal is basically a free command point reroll on a model. Um, I don't think this is very useful at all. You have plenty of rerolls as is, and wasting this is is is, is, is this three EP, which is really, really expensive, is just not worth it for what you get out of it. If it was at one EP or two EP, then maybe I'd debate it, but at three, absolutely not. And the reason I've got Frag and Crack Grenades in red here and I'm saying you shouldn't be taking them is because you can take a model that gets them for free. So you have to have a very good reason not to take that model and be taking those the, those free equipment options um, in the first place uh, to, to get it. So if you're spending equipment and not taking that model, it's kind of a, a waste. So the things that I'm usually spending my, my, my equipment points on are those scopes, those blessed bolts, and the ore specs. And I cannot like understate the usefulness of being able to ignore obscurity and the massive mental capacity that puts in your opponent to be trying to figure out those angles, those overwatch angles that, that could come, those blast angles that could come just by having that model on the board. But clearly you want to know some stats, right? So how is it actually affecting your odds of, of killing stuff, right? So if we look at the Vengeance class scope, it's going to give you against a Horde model a 28% uh, damage boost uh, and against a mid-range a 34% damage boost. Against Elite, it's going to give you a 42% damage boost. That's really, really impactful and is really going to increase your chance to kill. Um, you know, And when we look at, like, saying a, a standard uh, Intercessor who's hitting on threes, P1, lethal five, double tap with a Doctrine up, right? So he's shooting into the, the hardest to kill Elite model. You're looking at a 61% chance to kill with an expected damage of 13. That's enough to kill their leader model, their, their champion. That's enough to, to really put through the hurt on a lot of, a lot of their key models. So this is a this is a massive buff. A thirty three percent increase is a huge damage increase that, that I think is is worth considering when you're going into some of these matchups. Let's look at the all specs though. Everyone thinks that the all specs is purely giving you that obscurity bonus, but it's not. It's also taking away their cover save. So although it's costing two EP, and you might think to yourself, but maybe I could just take three of those really really tasty vengeance class scopes. Remember, it's still giving you a damage buff. Okay, so let's look at the um, some of the options that we have. So if we're using a um, a frag grenade, because I'm I'm going to sort of spill the beans already on this one. I'm always putting the specs on the gunner. There's some reasons for that. We'll talk about it in tactics, but that's where it's going to go. And he's going to have access to frag. He's going to have access to crack, and he's going to have either a ceaseless or a stalker bolt rifle on the bottom of his gun. All right. So and the frag profile is going to give you a 44% damage boost. So it's going to go from a you know like a 9% chance to kill up to a 31% chance to kill, and an estimated damage up to 5.54 much more reliably injuring horde models. Same can be said if against mid-range. It's a 39% damage boost, with, with it now going up to 4.6% uh, chance uh, to, to, to injure. 
sorry, 4.6% t- uh, average damage, which is going to have a 21% chance to kill. Against Brutes, again, it's going to give that 44% damage buff. And against Elites, it's going to give a 33% damage buff, which is not nothing, but it's but it's still good. With the Crack Grenade profile, though, it's going to give you a 29% damage boost. And that's uh, against Horde models, meaning you're going to go up to an 83% chance to kill, uh, expected damage of 10, which is really, really big. Against Midrange, it's going to give you a 22% uh, damage buff, buff and against a brute it's going to give a 29 percent damage buff against elites it's going to be a 15 percent damage buff and the reason why it's it's less is that obviously the better your save your opponent the more likely are to make that save anyway even looking at the standard bolt rifles though we're looking at a 29 percent damage buff with when you're looking at your auto bolt rifle against horde 24 percent against your mid-range a 29 percent against brutes and a 17 percent against your elites and finally with the stalker bolt rifle looking at a 28 percent damage buff against horde a 22% damage buff against mid-range, a 28% against brute, and a 14% against against those elites. So it is a really significant um, damage buff, as well as letting you shoot through obscurity. And that's why I think it's really, really valuable. So don't discount your specs whenever you, you, you want to use it. Okay, recusium best bolts. These are the ones that are probably going to get the most attention because they do give what on the surface is is some of the, the flattest damage buff that you can, you can receive, right? So... Um, if we look at the uh, across the board, it's pretty much a 30% damage increase. Um, and this is particularly useful when you have it on the C2 ceaseless profile of your leader, where against a horde model or a mid-range model, uh, a mid-range is probably better because that's like against Harlequins, you have a 72% chance to kill uh, with an expected damage of eight. That's really, really high, right? So you can reliably kill two Harlequin clowns with your leader shooting with this profile, even though they're in cover or they have their Sadath up. I think that's really, really important and really, really impactful. Um, so the, the rest of the numbers you can see there, but generically, it's it's a very good profile. And I, I'd highly recommend that people use this profile um, against those key damage break points of, of, of eight wounds. Um, so that's kind of what, what I'm looking at. Now, what I would say is one caveat is if you're playing against like Nurgle and they're going to reduce your damage from four down to three, don't be taking this. Just take the, the lethal five. It's, it's, it's better for you um, in, in that matchup. So we're going to roll straight into the strategic ploys, and I'm going to give you sort of the uh, traffic light system for them as well, right? So you have um, three options when it comes to doctrine, and one uh, tactical ploy that says, and they shall know no fear, right? So it's nice and simple, devastated doctrine. You're going to get re-rolls, shooting at models that are outside of six inches of your own models. Really, really simple, really nice. Tactical doctrine, when they're within six inches and shooting, you're going to get a re-roll. Again, really nice. And they shall know no fear is going to work as a, as a means to ignore injury or APR modifiers. Now, I think personally you should be using methodical and therefore you can save yourself this CP. But if you're not using methodical, then that's fine. It's a, it's a, it's a niche case use when you think you need to use it to be able to uh, maintain eff- effectiveness with your Marines. The Assault Doctrine, I do think is a niche case use. I think if you're he- leaning heavily into melee and you need it to work, then fine, um, go for it. But generically, I think you're going to get more re-rolls more often out of the Devastator and the Tactical Doctrine. So those are my two go-to picks. And when I'm saying, when I'm uh, trying to in my head uh, determine which one I'm going to use, I just count up how many re-rolls I think each one will give me and try to opt for the one that's going to give me more re-rolls. So if I look at the board and I think that three of my guys are going to be shooting greater than six and only two of my guys are going to be shooting within six, I'm going to be uh, choosing the Devastator Doctrine because that's going to give me six re-rolls, whereas the other one will only give me four. And it's as simple as that. I like to always pick the most efficient means of getting those re-rolls on the table. There are some caveats, you know, if you there's a, a priority target that you really have to kill, um, maybe you switch it up. But generically, that's kind of one of the main things I'm taking uh, going forwards. Let's look at some tactical ploys, though. There's two that I think are absolute standouts that are really, really good. Wrath of Vengeance and Angel of Death. So Wrath of Vengeance is leaning heavily into what Marines want to do, which is be mobile, be ag- aggressive, and kill enemy models, right? So it's going to let you shoot on death once you've been uh, killed. Now, note, you still have to be uh, able to validly shoot, so you have to be on an engage order, you have to, you can't be in engagement range and that sort of thing. But what it's going to let you do is get more shots off and remove more models from the board, which is really, really good. I think you want to be saving CP for this wherever you can do. The other option, of course, is Angel of Death. And this lets you fight at the end of the um, the firefight phase. So this is going to be one where there's a model that you need to kill or a model that you've charge blocked. Maybe you can use that to clear up the board 
and uh, and get a better position going to the next turning point or remove a key model from an objective or that sort of thing. Finally, there's two more. There's transhuman physiology. That's going to let you change a regular hit to a crit save. Sorry, a regular save to a crit save. This is niche. I would say only use it if it's actually going to make a difference between your model surviving or dying. Um, otherwise, I, I wouldn't wouldn't bother. Or if it's going to change a break point from a subsequent attack. So let's say it's going to put you onto um, uh, six wounds and you know that you have a model that's shooting you that has a base damage of five. Maybe that's worthwhile. All right. But otherwise, I, I wouldn't use it too much. Um, and finally, adaptive tactics. This is one of the ones that's going to let you change your tactic, chapter tactics at the start of the game. Generically, my advice is don't use this. Okay, I know there is some um, some advanced plays where you can think about switching rapid into dueler to increase your probability to kill in, in melee and that sort of thing. And I understand the, the debate there and the argument for it, but I think you have you only have seven CPs on this team, and and you really want to spend them more efficiently. Uh, and Coran and I love to talk about uh, CP budgets, so we'll talk about it now, and, and it will sort of explain why I think spending one of them at the start of the game is is really hurtful later on. So, CP budget then. You have seven CP with this team. There's no way to get more. There's no way to, to really get less unless your opponent has a way to make you spend uh, spend more f f for a doctrine, say. The way that I like to break this out is you have effectively three to four for your doctrines and three to four for tabloids. And then you have optionally zero to one for a CP reroll. So doctrines, the question is going to be, do you think you're shooting on turn one? And do you think you're shooting with more than one shooting attack? So if you think you're going to get a frag off and it's going to hit five or six people, whatever it's going to be, and you have loads of rerolls and you have some double shoot options, your enemies being really aggressive and you want to meet them face on, then absolutely go ahead, spend that turn one uh, devastated doctrine, get stuck in, right? But if you don't think it's going to happen, save that CP, use it for a tap ploy later on, you'll thank me later. This is why I think the um, methodical is now a auto-include for me, is because I was often having to spend CP on, and they shall know no fear, to keep my models operationally effective and keep them killing throughout the game. But now, I think actually, you don't want to do that, right? Like, if you can avoid spending that three to four CP on they, and they shall know no fear, it's going to give you access to those tap ploys we talked about above, which are really, really impactful. And I said, I say this again: you always want to be spending on Wrath of Vengeance and Angel of Death where possible to maximise your killing potential. You really want to focus on removing as many enemy models from the board as early as possible throughout the game to be able to make it easier for you to score later on. And you only really have, with that sort of mindset, about one CP available for a, a, a CP reroll. Now, I'm not saying don't ever use it. Don't ever use more than one CP on a CP reroll. If, you know, if, it, if it's game-defining that you kill a model, then absolutely sink all your CP into it. But just know that every CP you spend is going to take away a tap ploy from you or it's going to take away a doctrine from you later on. And you really want to be trying to use three tap ploys and three doctrines where you can do um, so you have one flex on, on, on CP is probably the way that I would, I would CP budget myself going forward. So when you're doing that CP reroll, ask yourself the question, is this going to change the game state? Is this going to win me the game, lose me the game? Is it going to score me a lot of VP? Yes, no. And if it's not, save that CP, use it for Wrath of Vengeance later on. It's It'll be far more impactful. Any questions on um, the strap ploys, Connor, or the tap ploys from, from the team? No, but you said something really good. Um, I want to repeat it because it, it just made so much sense to me. So one thing which went through quite a lot of data there, and one thing that stood out to me with that data was just how valuable a reroll is and how much that can really increase the odds of killing or injuring and making your models do more for their buck. So I think the doctrines are going to be crucial to how you how you run this team. And your your idea there of just simply assessing the board state, counting how many rerolls are going to be within six, how many are going to be over, and then making that decision is a really good way of knowing which doctrine I should be taking. Yeah, absolutely. And I do that every single time. It's just count up the amount of rerolls, um, and, and it, it really does pay dividends. Um, I promise you that. Okay, so the next part of looking at a team's analysis is looking at how you're going to score points, all right? So the main thing here is going to be TAC Ops. Now, they have three specific faction TAC Ops. They have Champion of Mankind, they have Shock and Awe, and they have Indomitable uh, Superiority. So the first two, Champion of Mankind and Shock and Awe, are actually pretty good, all right? So Champion of Mankind has a great synergy with Seek and Destroy. You want to be going out, you want to be killing models, and you want to be trying to you know, um, do that as effectively as possible. The downside is going to be 
it's the bookkeeping that comes with it. So when I'm at a tournament, trying to keep track of how many kills each of my individual models has made and how many kills each of my opponent's models have made can be like a, a mental tax that I just sometimes just don't want to pay. I, I do think arguably, though, against most horde and mid-range teams, it's probably one of the, the best tack up you can take. But just note that it, it comes with a lot of bookkeeping. So if you're not an advanced player and you just want to keep it nice and simple, maybe just park this one um, to, to avoid you that, that mental tax uh, going forwards. And also against elite teams, it's probably not worth it either. So if you're playing against a, a mirror match or against legionary, I'd probably say this isn't the one to take because you're probably not going to get that many double kills um, and or your opponent might get a double kill and suddenly this this this, this skews this result. Trokinor, I think, really enjoys the new format of six objectives. That means it makes it a really good pick because effectively your opponent like is guaranteed to take two objectives on turn turn one you know if they don't then something has gone horribly wrong so that gives you an, an opportunity to take an objective on turn two and then another opportunity to take an objective on turn three and before you know it, you should have maxed this as a shock and awe so you have good opportunities to score it um, and, and it works works pretty well and again this this has great synergy with what you're trying to do right that you're trying to move forwards you're trying to get onto objectives and take them from your opponent that sounds ideal um but why wouldn't you try and do that the only problem with it is is note that your opponent is trying to do exactly the same thing as well, right? So um, if your game's going bad and you're not able to take those primary objectives, well, it's probably going to be worse for you because now suddenly, not just you're not scoring your primaries, but you're also not scoring your secondaries. So um, just be just be cautious of that. You know, if your opponent's um, smart enough, they could throw quite a lot of bodies onto objectives like vet guards, say, and if you can't kill them as efficiently as required, they might be taking those objectives away from you and you're going to end up being denied those points. Um my final thing is going to be indomitable superiority. This is a very high risk tack up, and I would almost say never take it. Like I can't really see a game where you really want to take it, and you think that you're going to be, the, uh, you know, beating your opponent so well that you can take this. Uh, it's very much a win more tack up to tack up, um, and I would say very high risk. Don't bother with it at all. But let's look at the other ones that are available. So those are the faction attack ops, right? But let's look at the Seek and Destroy deck, because I think that's a really good deck. Now, I ran at the um, uh, the Warhammer Fest tournament the same three attack ops every single game, um, and I dropped basically one or two points, uh, one point, I think it was, uh, most games on, on Eliminate Guards, <clears throat> where I think I probably would have maxed had I taken... Uh, champion of mankind but i was happy to pay the tax of the getting a bit more you know headroom thing about other things so my recommendation would be take route take robin ransack and take eliminate guards those three options are phenomenally good they synergize so well with what you want to do as a team they work well with the play style there is absolutely no reason why you shouldn't be taking them the other options, Executioner and Headhunter, they're a bit more niche case. You know, if you're playing against an elite team and you think they're going to be aggressive and they're going to push out towards you, um, then yeah, sure, take Headhunter. You know, it might, it might work well for you. Um, but, you know, make sure you have a game plan for it. Uh, same can be said with like Executioner. Potentially that it will work well in some games, but also it, it can put a huge target on a certain model's back and you don't really want that. So um, think about how you're going to use those. And finally, Assassinate Target is one that I'd say never take. It's so hard for you to score it and so easy for your opponent to deny it. Um, leave that one at home. Focus on uh, the, the the above ones instead. Um, and my final bit of advice is going to be, you know, with, with Route and Robin Ransack and, and those sorts of things, is you, you want to be moving up the board. And it's going to be really tempting for you to score Robin Ransack on turn two with a very early melee kill. I would say... Try not to do that, right? So, like with Robin Ransack, you want to be scoring that on turn three and turn four. Unless, unless you think you're not going to make it to turn three and turn four, then fine, go ahead. But if you can score Robin Ransack on turn four, it becomes magnitudes harder for your opponent to deal with it and to be able to deny you those two VP. So think about that as a late game option for you uh, to get those points. And you don't have to score route on turn two. You know, it, you can get it on turn three, you can get it on turn four. If you can get it on turn two, awesome, great stuff. Um, but note how they can all pair really well together. You know, your last activation on turn four could be killing a guard on an objective um, that's within six inches of your opponent's drop zone and is a valid Robin Ransack target. And suddenly you've scored all of your secondaries or, you know, four points from secondaries and you're on an objective uh, for a single activation. That's where they can be so efficient. Okay. 
Let's look at security though, the other option, all right? So security, I think is a bit more niche for this team as an elite team, right? So seize ground or seize access point, I think uh, you know, it, it's pretty good. It's, um, it's, it's, it's useful, but it does telegraph what you want to try and do. And it also means that you might have to be holding some of your models back, not denying your opponent's objectives towards the end game when you only have a very finite number of models on the board in the first place. But central control and secure center line could pair well with that potentially. If you have models all in the same place, they could be scoring the same sort of objectives. Um, but again, it's that caveat of they're not necessarily going to be able to get across and do what they want to do um, elsewhere. Hold them back and protect assets. So it, it was an elite team. It's so hard to cover all of the board angles and all the uh, the areas where a team could get uh, hold them back. With them only having to get across the halfway line. Um, they're probably going to get there and they can probably just wait out your activations and go there at the end. And it's going to be very hard to stop them from doing it. And protect assets, well, double kills um, throughout the game on objectives can be really hard. And it might be that you want to be killing their primary damage dealers, like their plasma guns and their melter guns that actually aren't on objectives. So you don't want to be killing chaff models to score v uh, VP when you want to be killing the good models to score VP. Finally, escort operative. You have to declare it so early and your models, albeit durable, will get focused on if they are a big target like an escort operative and you don't have the uh, the activation advantage just to wait out your opponent's movements you have to move them out into the open and you need your models to be doing stuff so you can't be holding a guy back not getting kills and not doing damage um, when you need them to be uh, to score you points okay that's all that's a lot on data on um tac ops corner any questions on their their scoring no i, lo I love what you said and i think i agree with it wholeheartedly I would definitely lean into the seek and destroy deck. Um, I think it just it works with the aggressive mobile play style that these guys have. Uh, one thing that I'd probably add, uh, I think eliminate guards is a good pick, and it can be used defensively. By which I mean, uh, let's imagine a, a turn two scenario uh, where the the opposition has got a plasma gun in a nice place where it could be quite threatening to you and uh, start putting wounds down on your models, but you can use an eliminate guard in that. Um, strategic step on a different model so now say they want initiative they have to choose do I activate the plasma gunner and do the damage or do I take that model that's just been picked for eliminate guards and move him to safety and they've got a choice to make then and hopefully you can win either way there another thought as well uh, with that route tactic perhaps that's one where you could reveal that turn one as part of the mind games so that you've revealed a seek and destroy tack op perhaps you've got headhunter as another tack op and they're going to want to play their sergeant a bit more cagey now and keep them back and not in the thick of the fight. Got to love those mind games. That's a really good point. Okay, so we're going to, I think, roll into some generic team compositions just so we can show people what I think they should be building their team based upon who they're looking at across the, uh, at the table from them. So uh, the way I've looked at this is I've, I've gone for like a, a basic and an advanced sort of formats, um, and then I've looked at potentially... Uh, a sort of experimental format, which I've given a little bit of practice to, where I think actually there's there's some utility in that um, going forward. So let's start with the the, the, the basic anti elite, all right? So this is the where you have four gunners and two melee options, right? So um, this is if you're if you're new to the game, you're you're not too uh, you know in depth in tactics, and you, you know you're going against a an elite player, and you, and you want a list, right? So so you're gonna look at the assault sergeant armed with a plasma pistol. The Assault Grenadier armed with crack and frag grenades, but you're only really going to be using the crack grenade. The Incessor Gunner armed with a bolt rifle and a combat blade uh, as a piece of equipment. And then three Incessors with the bolt rifles. So that's going to be your Lethal 5 uh, uh, P1 weapons. That's just going to be your, your, your run in the mill. So if you're fairly new to the game and you want to just uh, get to grips with it and you're not too worried about you know um, the most advanced plays that you can do, this will be a, a, a basic way of, of running the, the team against an elite uh, opponent. Um if you do want to play a bit more advanced though, and you think that you can play around with some potential some melee options, and you think maybe you can beat your opponent in, in those melee options, maybe you're playing against Phobos or like that, and you want to run a sort of advanced anti-elite, well, you could switch to having three gunners and three melees. So instead, you could have an assault sergeant with a plasma pistol. The assault grenadier is in there again, and this time taking an assault incessor alongside. You're then going to take the incessor gunner, and he's going to take the stalker bolt rifle. He's also going to have the ore specs, giving him the ability to ignore security, and the combat blade. And then two regular incessors. One's going to have what's referred to as a Doom Bolter. That's both having the Lethal 5, a P1, Vengeance Scope, and the 4-5 damage, giving him a really effective shooting profile. And the other one's just going to have a Combat Blade and Bolt Rifle. 
So that's a, a slightly different tw- uh, t- tweak on it, but lets you play a slightly more advanced uh, method against anti-elite. But potentially there's, there's, there's one other way that I would play it, which I'll talk about later on. Okay, let's look at anti-midrange then. So this is going to be a 5 and 1 profile. You have the Incessor Sergeant, and he's going to have this ceaseless profile on his auto bolt rifle, and also the Reclusion Blessed Bolts. I'd highly recommend taking the power weapon with him. That's going to give you access to 4-5 damage, but also 4-6 in the, in the format of his uh, power weapon. And it's going to make him really reliable at killing mid-range opponents. You're going to take the Assault uh, Grenadier, because, let's be honest, it's a, an auto-include with those crack grenades. Uh, you're also going to take the Incessor Gunner with a Stalker Bolt Rifle, and he's going to take the All Specs. You're then going to take an Incessor with Bolt Rifle, with a Vengeance Scope, so that Lethal 5, and then two more with just uh, Combat Blades. So I'm leaning quite heavy into shooting here, and the reason why is because I think generically, with those um, Harlequin uh, profiles, also the uh, the um, Eldari profiles, they're going to be quite hard for you to be able to deal with. Uh, in melee, they're going to do a lot more, da- lot more damage to you with power weapons and that sort of thing. So this is your Dakari and your Corsairs. Um, what I would say is if you get Harlequins, those P1 uh, bolt rifles on your two incessors at the bottom, I'd switch those out into those ceaseless variants because the AP is going to make no difference to you. And same can be said for the stalker bolt rifle and the incessor gunner. Okay, so let's look at some basic anti-horde. So if we have the incessor sergeant, I'm going to be giving him an auto bolt rifle and a power weapon for that reclusion best bolts. Uh, I'm also going to take the assault grenadier. I'm also going to take the incessor gunner, but I'm going to give him an auto bolt rifle. But he's going to be taking both that all specs and that combat blade. I'm then going to take an incessor with a bolt rifle, and he's going to have that vengeance class scope. Note that it has to go on a bolt rifle, not an auto bolt rifle. And finally, I'm going to have two more guys just armed with auto bolt rifles. So this is a basic anti horde. You're not having to worry too much about doctrines or anything like that, and it's going to be very, very reliable and effective for you. Let's say though you're playing against a, um, a, a vet guard player, and you want to lean slightly more heavily into melee or something like that, and you think you're a bit more of an advanced player. Well, the option you have here then. He's potentially going to advance anti horde, but you're going to have a three and three split. So you have the Intercessor Sergeant. He's going to have the auto bolt rifle and the power weapon. It's just very, very efficient, efficient in killing everyone. Uh, and he's going to take those reclusion best bolts. You're going to take the Grenadier, um, the Assault Grenadier, and you're going to take the Gunner with the Ore Specs and the Combat Blade. I cannot stress enough, having access to that Ignore Obscurity and Blast is going to be really, really useful in these matchups. And finally, you're going to take an Incessor with Bolt Rifle and the Vengeance Class Scope, also with a Combat Blade. You're also going to take just two regular assault incessors. And the idea with these guys is you want to be moving up, killing their key threat models in melee so they can't in death atone and shoot you back, which will be really, really powerful for them. So make sure you focus on killing those metal guns and those plasma guns. Finally, I think this is something that we should be looking at as a, a as an option, and it's a, a bit more experimental. Now, I've gone for three Vengeance class scopes here, but actually I would say... Depending upon your opponent, you probably want to switch out one and, and take um, the extra option of a an all specs, but 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 bear with. So this is one I'm going to play against um, a, a lot of teams. I think it's very very useful to have access to just a huge amount of shooting. So the bolt rifle and power from the incessor sergeant is just very very useful. The assault grenadier with the crack and frag grenade is really good. The incessor gunner with bolt rifle again is good. I would I would debate taking the stalker bolt rifle most of the time though, particularly if he's using the all specs. If he's not using the all specs, I, I wouldn't take it. And then incessors with with vendors class scopes and bolt rifles. This is just really good at putting out high volume of damage against a lot of people. So um, think about this in, against your Nurgle matchups where you just want a lot of three four damage. This is a, a way of spamming it, and it's a bit more experimental. But you know something for you to to, to play with. But that's your generic um, uh, list options, and um, we'll, we'll have a bit more to think about that and, and, and go through it. And I might might revise those in future when I have a bit more detail. Okay, game plan then. This is what people, most people want to know, Connor. Um, I've broken this down into like, your game plan based on the four turning points. I tried to keep it like really sort of like a, a core principles kind of thing. So I've gone with how much risk you're going to take, what your priority is going to be, and what the objective is going to be on each turning point. So turning point one, your risk is going to be low, all right? Like do not take much risk turning point one where you don't need to, all right? So make sure that whatever shots you're taking are high probability is kill, Make sure that you know you're you're doing the the guaranteed actions. The priority in doing this turning point has to be positioning. All right, so let's focus on that. Let's make sure your models are in the right place and they're setting up for threat saturation on turning point two. That must be your objective, right? You must have threat saturation on turning point two. So at least two models ready to get double kills on turning point two. Turning point two, then, it's got to be a moderate level of risk. 
you're going to lose models. There's nothing you can do about it, right? That is just the, the, the way the game's going to go, but you don't want to lose all six, all right? So you want to, you want to keep your losses to one or two models, um, but the priority has to be doing more damage than your opponent is going to do to you. So you want to double kill or ideally triple kill. So we talked about Wrath of Vengeance before, that's what you want to be doing, all right? So you want to be getting those models to to move out, double shoot or double fight, and then be in a position to, to Wrath of Vengeance, crack grenade someone else or shoot someone else and try to get those triple kills where you can do. But also you want to start thinking about Overwatch. So Overwatch is, is a key mechanic when it comes to, to, to these teams, right? So during turning point one, Overwatch can be used to deny some angles. And on the Patreon, I'm going to do a... Um, a little bit more of a, a deep dive on this, where I'm going to do a video guide on, on, on how I'm using Overwatch to, to cover off lines of approach. I think it's really important to, to, to do that, um, but also to try and set up more kills, all right? So moving within range of, of models to, to allow you to have an Overwatch uh, opportunity is, is really important. In turning point three, you're going to take high risk, all right? Like your, your models are, are getting to the point now where their usefulness is spent, okay? And um, that might sound quite mean, but that, that is kind of where it is. Uh, the priority here has to be damage, but you also really need to start focusing on scoring. You know, this is where you want to be getting attack ops done, making sure that you're getting your VP, because if you haven't got your two attack ops uh, at least started by this point, then it's it, you're going to start denying yourself points. So a lot of the attack ops take, take two turns to do. You must start scoring them on turn three to make sure you can max them on turn four. And the objective here, again, is going to be killing efficiently, Try to get those double kills before your model gets removed, but also getting those points in. So take more risks to be able to achieve that as you go forwards. Finally, you've reached turning point four. You're at the end of the game. Your level of risk can go mental. Go extreme, right? So it doesn't make a difference if your guy survives at the end of the game, apart from your Robin Ransack dude, so long as you're getting your points and denying your enemy points as much as possible. So focus on scoring and denying, right? So make sure you max points at the end of that game. Make sure you deny as many enemy points as you possibly can do, right? So get up there, kill their key models that are scoring them points, kill their escort operatives, kill their courier, whatever it's going to be. Make sure you score your Robin Ransack and keep that guy safe. And if needs be, throw more models in front of him to protect that guy from, from, from dying. And that's going to be a, a main way that you're going to play your game plan. So I want to show you that that's how this team's going to build, right? The longer they get into the game, the more risk they're going to take. You're going to position, you're going to damage, you're going to score, and you're going to deny. And that's the sort of the game plan you're going to go through with this with this team. Any thoughts on the game plan, Connor? No, I think it's a very... Um, that's that's the game plan that, that I'd be taking. R risk is, is to be had, but it's at the end when it's you've really got to win the game. At the start, you will throw the game if you go all in. Um I mean, sorry, go aggressive and uh, laugh for the blood god. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Um, all right, so I'll, let's talk about some tactics then, because I think it's really useful to give you some some ways that you can actually achieve this game plan on the table. So um, a, a somewhat obvious one that probably people, a lot of people are familiar with is going to be the double grenade, right? So um, you, have, you have two options here. You have your gunner and you also have your um, grenadier. Now, your grenadier can't do two frag grenades, but your gunner can do two frag grenades from his grenade launcher. Now, you can move this guy out or even move Dash and shoot his grenade launcher into a clump of enemies, all right? But leave him in a way where he's exposed where he could die, all right? Now, if your opponent doesn't see this coming, they might shoot another plasma gun at him and kill him, at which point you spend your 1 CP, you do Wrath of Vengeance, and you fire a second frag grenade into that same cluster of enemies. Now, if you're methodical, you're not taking any negative to, uh, to hit on this, right? So it's just as if you'd done the previous attack. And I talked before about how you expect chip damage with a lot of these weapons. Well, suddenly, if they are doing two rounds of shooting, that chip damage actually becomes really effective and you have a good chance of killing them. So a double grenade is really, really useful. Note, you can also do this just by uh, queuing up both the grenade launcher and your grenadier to be able to potentially move your grenade launcher out and shoot. Then on your second activation, move the grenadier up and throw a grenade. That can be a really good way of achieving the same thing. Let's talk about Overwatch. You want to maximize your killing potential. So when you're moving models around, it could be tempting for you to shoot the model that's directly in front of you. But when I'm moving a model, if I can, what I want to do is I want to move him within two inches of a guy that's already activated. So I have that overwatch possibility there, and then I'm going to shoot two other models. Right? And that sounds somewhat, somewhat odd. Like you move really close to the model, you want to shoot the guy that's right next to you. No, I'm going to shoot other people. And because if I use my two shoot actions against other people that haven't yet activated, when it comes back to my turn, I'm going to get to shoot the guy that's within two inches of me. And if someone kills me in the meantime, I'm going to get to Wrath of Vengeance and shoot the guy that's within two inches of me. So I'm always going to get that shoot option. 
And that's how I'm going to maximize that killing potential. I don't want to shoot the, the people that have already activated. I want to shoot the ones that haven't activated. And I want to try and get those, those options to kill the right models where I want to kill them. But also, you can use area denial. So you can position in angles where, by, by using your non-reciprocal shooting and your obscurity, you're safe unless they have a method of ignoring obscurity themselves. But you can cover an angle where if your opponent swings around and starts trying to take uh, more ground or shoot a different model, potentially he's going to have return fire. So now they're certainly going to have to do that as a last activation, or they're going to have to expose a model to a turn one shoot next turn, and that can be really painful for them. So make sure you're using Overwatch with elite teams. It really is a critical part of how this team is uh, performs and how it does well. Charge block it is as simple as it sounds, right? You're going to send a model and charge it into an already activated model or, or a group of models and and not kill them, right? So this might be that you have a an intercessor. He's shot twice already and he's killed two guys and there's a, a guardsman that's within charge range of him and he's already activated. So you just charge into him and you wait. At the end of the turn, you can use Angel of Death and fight that model for free and maybe pick up a kill or get them to the point where they're so weak that you can kill them again very easily in your next fight action. That's really, really useful. So that's a, a good way of keeping your models safe, but also um, getting up there and, and taking ground and, and killing more models. Um, and don't be afraid to, you know, to, to if you are an assault intercessor and you want to stay alive and you're on one wound remaining wherever it's going to be, you could charge someone and uh, and parry them out, right? If, if, they, if they fight you, you don't have to, to, to kill them. Um, you might leave them on one wound remaining so that you can then do more next turn when it's going to be. So don't be afraid to do that and, and have that angel of death in the pocket as well to be able to get yourself back back out of that combat ready to fight again at the start of the next turn. The next thing I'll say, this is this is a generic point for elite teams, all right? You are three APL and you have to use that to bully your opponent on their objectives. So you want them to commit two models to an objective. Wherever you can, if you're moving, if you're charging, if you're shooting, wherever it's going to be, just get a a toe, one tiny slither of your base onto their objective. So they have to now commit more models to taking it back from you. Keep doing that wherever you can. Dominate those objectives and bully them and make sure you always have a toe on it. Because if you can do that, it's going to make your opponent have to commit more resources into your threat bubble where you're going to more efficiently going to kill them and you're going to be able to overwatch them and you're going to do damage to them. And that's exactly what you want to do, right? So those are the generic tactics that I think apply to this team and they're really, really useful throughout both open board and into the dark. But we do have some specific into the dark tactics as well, which I think is worth touching on now. Hatchway fight. So you might have seen this if you went on full scale wargaming and, and had a look at their bat rep. Uh, Andy managed to get a hatchway fight off of me in turn one by using a model on conceal. This I think is a really good point, right? So you can use your your uh, assault incessors on hatchways uh, to, to hatchway fight whilst on conceal turn one, which people won't necessarily see coming. So they, they can move up, sit on a hatchway, and if you're within two inches, they can fight you from conceal. Now, the also sneaky thing you can do with this is you can do it as an angel of death as well, right? So if someone leaves a model at the end of the turn and they are within two inches of a hatchway, so they position their plasma gunner ready to shoot you, start the next turn, wherever it's going to be, you spend a CP and on conceal, you fight that model before they have a chance to be able to do anything at the end of the turn. This can be huge. This is a really, really good way of dominating the hatchways, the key bits of movement on the map, and force your opponent to stay away from them. If they put their models close to it, you get the advantage, you get to fight them, while still on conceal, as opposed to what they think is, is no threat. And that's really, really useful. Guard is your friend as well, particularly if you're using methodical so i keep going back to methodical but my god it's so good so if you're using methodical you want to be using guard efficiently so let's say that you can't necessarily get a shot uh or you can't get a double shoot action where you want to get it but you can get one off or shoot once then move then guard and just lock down areas of the map try to use non-reciprocal shooting where you can do right so try and make sure that you can um get the the, the, the shots where and when you want them and that sort of thing all right so this is a, a really good way of um evening the odds against against a lot of teams. But remember, you still have Overwatch available to you as well. So you, you can still shoot twice, move somewhere, and then Overwatch later. You don't have to guard, but it's there as a, as a means to have that advantage when you do it. And finally, there's a, a really big thing that I need to make up when it comes to hatchways of when you want to be open and when you want them to be closed. So generically, there are two types of teams. There's volume damage teams and there's burst damage teams, right? Intercession is a volume damage team, right? So it wants to be doing lots of activations, shooting stuff. 
Legionary, for example, are a burst damage team. They want to have a few activations where they do a lot of damage in that activation itself, right? So their their plasma gun does more damage averagely on a single shot than our bolt rifles. But if we shoot twice, we do more damage than them. This is an example, right? So you need to look at who you're playing against and, and how the board state is playing out. So let's say that your opponent has lots of models on engage and you're worried about getting shot this turn. Well, keep the hatchway closed and then you know that when you open it on turn two, you're going to have plenty of targets. So you're going to be able to get your volume of fire through. Let's say your opponent has lots of models on conceal. And therefore, if you open the hatchway, you're not going to have any targets. Well, then move it and open it on turn one so that you can move forward turn two, get within range and get the volume of fire off. All right. So that's kind of like my, my mindset is understanding that this is a volume damage team and you might need to control those hatchways in different ways based upon what you're seeing across the board from you. So look up, look across to what your opponent's doing and base your hatchways being open or closed based on what they're doing. Connor, any thoughts on those um, those tactics? Uh, no, I think you've um, you've covered that quite nicely. One thing that you haven't uh, necessarily touched on at this point, though, is that uh, that all specs through obscurity. How often are you considering that? Is that all the time we're, we're thinking of that? Yeah, so I'm a massive advocate for the all specs through obscurity. So um, you look at like the Octarius board, the ability to move onto a vantage point and an all specs a model and shoot is really really strong. Um, what I would say is when it comes to model selection and who you're putting it on, I always put it on the gunner. And the reason why I do this is because against a good opponent, if you telegraph a obscured shot, which you're always going to have to do, right, because you're, you're only six models, um, they have the option to, to deny it. So you don't want to telegraph. So let's say you have a really good alpha strike and it's going to be I, either you've left the model exposed and I can all spec them and shoot them with a blast weapon and hit your entire team. Well, if I move a model out, or specs them, and then twiddle my thumbs for an, an activation, well, they're going to move that oh, that single model to a point where he's now no longer vo uh, vulnerable before your blast weapon can move out and shoot them. So I really like the ability to have the, the you know, move the, the gunner out, or specs and shoot, which is why I often just put the stalker bolt rifle on him, because the way I look at it is he's either going to be or specsing and shooting twice, if he can see from what, where he stood, or he's going to move or specs and shoot, and therefore having a heavy weapon for the overwatch doesn't really bother him because that's that's how, how it works so generically that's that's what i'm using him for i don't like telegraphing my my unobscured shots i like to be able to make it so people can't res respond to it they don't know it's coming and it's just doing the damage that it needs to do right there and right then but um I, I think almost in every matchup i'm going to take the all specs i think it adds a whole new layer to the game um and only in, in niche scenarios would i would i look at not taking it and any game i've played where i haven't taken it i've generally regretted it post i think so i think he's always going to be on my on my go-to list all right sweet so i think what we'll do now connor is we'll just look in some of the specific matchups and i'm just going to talk about how i think they they go and just some some sort of points. And I've sort of taken the the, the harder matchups from the the stats that we see from Hot Sauce Teddy. Um, I, I think it's probably worth just talking about how I would go about countering them, so people understand where where the the, the, the play might be. So we'll look first at Gallipox, right? So Gallipox are are pretty difficult to deal with. They have a very high win rate against in session because I think a lot of people go into them in, in, a, in a standard way that they play against most teams, and I just don't think it's the way to do it. So I think against Gallipox, your friend is shooting and your friend is volume of shooting with bolter discipline and overwatch and trying to do as much as you can and i don't think you want to get a melee at all because they're going to make you injured and they're going to be very very efficient at doing damage back to you and their feel no pains are going to massively hurt you there as well so how do you get the most amount of volume of, of of fire out well they only have one range weapon themselves or some such gloves but effectively they have one range weapon um and you have a lot if you double tap so i think you go full engage and you just try to put down as much lead as you can throughout the game. And you try to use all your overwatch to get all your models shooting effectively three times. If you can get all of your guys shooting three times every turn, even the big dudes will fall. And that's my, my, my promise to you. Just keep shooting them with the right doctrine up and do not let that firepower uh, at any point slow down. Because if you can do enough damage to them at range and they get wounded and they start slowing down, they don't make their charges anymore then they're going to really hurt to, to get to you. So try to use your movement advantage, get those shots off early, stay out of the threat ranges, and just shoot them to death. Okay, against Legionary, you're almost always looking at, at Nurgle Legionary in this matchup. 
I'd be very surprised if people don't. I think it's good for you if they take something else. Um, but let's let's take worst case scenario. Legionary, Nurgle Legionary. Lethal 5 P1 is your friend. I'm going to take two of those um, those options, the, the Vengeance class scopes. I'm going to take an all specs and I'm going to take some knives just because I have a bit of extra, extra damage. Again, I want to force through volume of fire, right? I want to put through as much P1 shooting, double tapping as possible against their models because that actually has quite a good chance to kill. And I want to make sure I'm focusing on removing each model from, from the board, right? Because if I take a plasma pistol and I shoot a Nurgle champ, have a guess what? Whatever you roll, he's probably going to fucking live. So don't, don't don't use that weapon against that guy. You know, the anointed is going to have the feel no pains. He's going to live, right? The, if you go into melee against them, the, the, the Shrive Talon, he's going to fight fast. First, sorry, he's probably going to live. All right, so like, you, that's not how you win against that team. You win by moving up within two inches of them, double tapping them in the face, leaving them on three wounds remaining and watching them try to panic is what they do next when they're anointed, can't kill you in one hit anymore. And you're probably going to get punched out by a regular intercessor. That's how I think you get around it. Um, so be aware of their burst damage. Be aware of those plasma guns, those heavy bolters, that sort of stuff. And be aware of their, me their melee. But just hard focus on getting the kills on the right people. Make sure you have that Wrath of Vengeance CP available for those um, the plasma guns and that sort of stuff. Don't give them easy shots. Uh, and then f like focus down on, on, on killing each model uh, as you can. Against Hunter Clade, I, I think actually this is one way you do take the plasma pistol, right? Because they have a lot of 10 wound models. And your um, assault intercessor sergeant is, is, is very, very good at de defending himself in melee. Um, but he's also, with that 5 6 damage, going to kill those Rust Stalkers or those uh, Sicarians pretty well. I think you absolutely have to have the ore specs in this matchup. Um, the you know the enemy's going to use their Omni specs to use that against you, and you've got to be careful of it, all right? And the, the main threat is going to be those Rust Stalkers coming in and double fighting you. You don't want to let them get in, in, in contact with your guys, so make sure you threat range them appropriately. It's so hard to do when they can just transverse barricades for free, like be aware of that. Um, but you can still use the defensive barricade profile that I talked about on the Patreon um, to, to stop them from getting their base placement, and that can still work, all right? So use the defensive um, barricade profile for counter melee. Use that effectively. Focus on trying to kill them where you want to kill them, and don't let those Rust Stalkers get off the damage that they really want to get off. If you can kill a lot of those Rust Stalkers early doors, suddenly the game swings heavy for you and their back line is still very fragile to shooting. So don't be afraid to take some shots there. Okay, Pathfinders. Oh, we. This is a, a rough matchup for Incession. I, I I honestly don't know what the uh, the the solution is. But what the, the benefit is I played, I think, arguably the best Pathfinder player on the planet the other day. Um, and I lost, but I learned a lot from it, which I think is really, really useful. So why did I lose? Well, I lost because I didn't threat saturate and I, I, I deviated from my game plan going forwards. And I think there's a tweak you can make to your list to help make the game plan better. So I think, weirdly, in this one matchup, you drop your Assault Incessor with the dual, gren uh, dual Grenades, and you run another regular Intercessor. This is because you want as much double shooting as possible, and you can give him a Frag Grenade, the knives make no difference, uh, and that's going to let you have a, a Blast option still there, but also actually give you a bit more flex to be able to move around the map, um, and give you the range damage that you need. So turn turn two, you have to have your threat saturation. They are going to kill one of your models on turn one, and there's nothing you can do about it. He can relentlessly fusion bomb you. He can relentlessly iron rifle you. He can steal initiative. There is nothing that you can he, you can do to stop from killing one of your models. You can try and use your Overwatch a little bit to, to, to zone off how much shooting he gets, but at the end of the day, your opponent is going to remove one intercessor of turn one. Just accept it. It's fine. You're going to win by picking up points late game on Seek and Destroy and trying to stop them from scoring their recon tack ops late game as well. So it, it is achievable. Um, but don't be afraid to charge block. Sure, they can spend a CP to get in there and, and, and still shoot you. But actually, fine. Them spending a CP on that is one less CP spent on um, you know recon sweeps or bonded or something like that. Um, but, you know, fine, whatever it is. Um, and then just focus on trying to kill the priority models, right? So the Assault Grenadier, he's he's, he's useful once when he has his, his Fusion Grenade, but after that, you don't really care too much. Um, the the Iron Rifles are, are the main damage dealers of the team. They're the ones that are actually going to put down your models. If you get the opportunity to kill an Iron, an iron Rifle before he shoots, you've got to take that opportunity, because if you don't, he's going to kill you on the return fire. And try your hardest where you can to position your models so you're not visible for Marker Lights. If you can do this, if you can make it so they can't stack Marker Lights turn one, it massively reduces their ability to do damage turn two and turn three. And that's going to be so useful for you going forwards, right? So deny Marker Lights where possible, 
kill those priority threats, so those iron rifles and those um, those uh, rail rifles, um, except that you're eating a fusion grenade. The, there's nothing you can do about that. They are it's 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 a horrible matchup for you, but that's where it is. And then try your best to threat saturate and use wrath of vengeance to maximize your kills because they they are going to have to kill you effectively and you have wrath of vengeance you have angel of death to try and kill them as effectively back as possible okay the final one i'll touch on is vet guard and i guess this sort of applies to kazakin as well because they're they're a similar profile um i think weirdly in these matchups you you kind of like melee and um and working around there in death atonement but this this matchup just basically comes down to can you prioritize threats and kill them effectively right so the, the Vet Guard have quite a lot of APT weapons. They have the mine. They have that sort of stuff. Um, and if you can kill those those threats in melee, then they can't in Death of Tone and they can't then do damage back to you. And that really hurts them. And if you remember that your opponent still needs um, line of sight to shoot their ignoring heavy weapon, well, then make sure you use obscurity and that sort of thing. And suddenly you, the, their sniper and that sort of stuff doesn't become too much of an issue. Um, but this is a hard game to, uh, game to, to, to play because... They can very easily sit on objectives and score points, and and you need to be able to push up, threat saturate, and stop them from doing that. But when you threat saturate, just think again, like, right, how am I killing the plasmas? How am I killing the melters? How am I killing the key models that I, I need to remove and not just killing chaff? Because if you, if, you, if you kill chaff early game, it just means you're going to lose late game because you won't have any models left. And that's kind of like my my main points on the, the matchups. Colin, any thoughts on those or anything you want to add in particular? Yeah, I just want to um, pick your brains back on Galapox. Do you think it's possible to maybe kill them too fast? Because um, when, when you, you're going to shoot them lots, but then they've got their, their vermin, haven't they? The mutoid vermin. And you're not going to be able... Like, if you kill too many of them and they're only left with vermin, you might be losing out on your route or your Robin Ransack because there's no available models to get that at the end. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, no, it's a really good point because obviously the vermin can't be scored for tac ops, and so you have to make sure you're killing the right guys. So the nightmare hulks, the mutants, um, and and the glitchlings. But what I would say is that's still like eleven models to kill. Um, and unfortunately, if you don't do this strategy, if you don't go out guns blazing and try and do as much damage as early as possible, then the Galapox player is going to to pressure you and win. Right. So like their game plan is: can they just move on to objectives, survive, and just deny you points and just soak up damage. So you just need to get out there, windmill in turn one, and just do as much damage as possible. Like, Galapox is a damage check. And I, I guarantee you, they're going to leave a glitchling exposed or um, a mutant that's going to be on one wound remaining that you can just go and smack on the head and, and, and get a kill for a Robin Ransack point or for a champion of mankind or something like that. Um, so yeah, you, you really need to focus on killing the big guys. And again, it's, it's sort of the same principles make sure you actually kill a big guy like don't don't leave him with one wound remaining because he's still going to go do quite a lot of damage um but yeah you you, you want to try and get get as much out there as possible even though there is a risk that you might lose a couple of points on tack ops as a result that's far far better than the risk of leaving them um with more models on the board towards the end of the game i think did you have any other points on any other matchups connor or? uh no not really but well it would be remiss of me not to mentioned something about legionary i suppose uh being a lover of corn but also no actually i think they are the, the primary team you're going to face I, th I think that's the team where you you've really got to be it's gonna be a very positional game um if you if you if you put your models in the in the wrong place that's when they can start charging with anointed or trying to get double kills with that aspiring champ because he is such a monster so i think really think about where you're positioning your models against legionary and it is going to be quite a close game because they're a very similar side. Yeah, absolutely. And like, there's a few points in there. Like, if you can target the anointed before he gets his full no pain up, that's 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 awesome. Um, you know, do that. Uh, if you can, you know, like focus down on, on a certain model, make sure you do that as well. But it's it's definitely a it's a game where a technique's going to play in a lot. It's it's got a lot better for you now. Like now that the the minimum damage is three, it makes the regular intercessor far far more valuable because you can be punching them for three when they charge you, which is more damage, uh, and you're shooting them for three four as well. So there's a chance now where you know if you do say ten damage to them on shooting, or even let's like, say nine damage, you you know you, you do nine damage on your shooting attacks, and they're left with three wounds remaining. Well. Actually, now that melee option, that Shrive talent, he under, he knows now that even if he charges you and fights you, he only gets one hit in before you punch and kill him. 
And that can be a massive psychological blow to your opponent's ability to get use those melee models effectively. Um, and even the plasma gun, we talked earlier on, you know, the plasma gun has like a, a 30% chance of killing or, or a 50% chance if it uses the CP reroll. It's not that good odds. Like, so there is a chance that he can whiff with that and he only has one opportunity. And if it does go wrong, then then so be it. Um, and like the lethal five P1, if you move up and you double tap the, the champ, even with those 13 wounds, you're probably going to kill him, right? So like, I think that's a really good point to, to, to think about is there is a there is a high chance that your your models will be just as killy as, as the legionary models are now, which a lot of the legionary guys maybe aren't expecting. So they might come back to you with a bit of previous experience of fighting in session and be overly aggressive aggressive and you might be able to, to punish that quite effectively with a with a heavy shooting team so um yeah it's definitely an interesting matchup i agree with you though it's it's probably in the legionary's favor um in fact all these matchups are it's why i sort of talked about them but but i don't think it's by any chance i'm unwinnable i've played all of those matchups and and won or lost both um for various reasons and i've tried to bring those those lessons from those those matchups back to you guys so i can think this is how i would go about playing it again in future to make sure that I, I I win. So I think probably there, Connor, we'll, 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 we'll wrap up and do a bit of a summary because I think we've covered off a lot. We've talked about a lot of data. We've gone through a lot of slides and, and you know, it's probably a lot, a lot to pick up on. Um, in, in summary, you know, I think this is an excellent beginner team. There is, there's actually a lot of depth in this team as well. Like it, it begins quite, quite easily. You know, that it seems on paper, there are just six morals that you shoot or, or fight or whatever. Um, but actually when you start to learn your specs, when you start to think about the doctrines play, the, the chapter tactics build and understand when you're going to switch to what and how you're going to use what in which situation, there is a bit of depth there. Um, generally, if, if I'm going to give you advice, I think shooting is best. It's easy just to set up. It's easy just to do. It's one way damage. Um, it has the least chance of going wrong. So, like, generally, if you're if you're struggling and unerring between which one to pick, go shooty. Right? You can't go too wrong, even if you turn up with six shooters and you just have one grenade launcher and a bunch of uh, guns and a guy with a power sword. Away you go. You're probably going to be fine on the day. I think they have a great synergy with seek and destroy. It plays into their game plan. We talked about the game plan. You know, they want to move at the board, they want to position, and they want to effectively kill models in the right places. And then you seek and destroy deck lets them do that 100%. Um, I've played most tournaments just running three tack ops. And I never really saw a reason to change it, um, which is which is awesome. And they, because they have such a low cognitive load when doing that. You know what, what, what team you're going to pick. You pick the same tack ops. You move in a similar way. And they're so efficient and so effective at what they do, which is awesome. And they're also making it really hard for your opponent to score tack ops as well, which is a, a, a really good, you know, like um, pairing to have is like, okay, so I'm going to be scoring quite easily and you're going to be scoring quite hard. That's a good rating, you know, a, a good beginning to, to, to have in a game. But, you know, just remember that they have limited ball control. There's, a, there's only six of them. There's only so much they can do. Um, just remember that when, when you're going forwards. Don't, don't throw away models needlessly because with six objectives, if you lose a guy, you can add to five models, well, you're always going to have one model less than, than you need for the objective. So consider that going forward as well. I think, Connor, I'm going to give them a, a competitive rating of a of an A tier. I think they're, they're a very strong competitive pick. I don't think they need nerfs. I think they're in a good place. Um, and I think they are, they're are they one of the better teams. Uh, what do you think, Connor? I agree 100%. Uh, yeah, this is a beginner side, but it's a beginner side with a very high ceiling. And if you enjoy them as a beginner, you're going to love them as you start to learn them. And... Uh, take them to the top level ideal Connor, was there anything else that you wanted to add in there or um to touch on before we before we sign off uh no but uh what i would say is this is obviously our, our first guide and this is what we think we've built a very good product here for, for for you and for the kill team community but you know let give us your feedback let us know what you know what do we miss uh what have you liked what didn't you like and what will be more useful next time because we're hopefully going to build more of these guides and it'd be great to know um, how we can make them more valuable and more useful for you. Absolutely. And so as I said, so f for all the patrons out there, you know, thank you so much for all the support because really it's it's you guys that mean that we can do this. Um, and give us give us your feedback. You know, let us know how we can make this a better product. Um, we'll, we'll put the PDF on the Patreon for you guys so you have that available and you can flick through all those stats in slow time and you, you can read it. Um, and you can also chat to us on the Discord about about your thoughts and and whatever else. But you know, for the list, other listeners out there, feel free to drop a comment and say uh, it would be really useful if you could add this or this into it because um, that, that's what I, I was hoping to see next time. So um, that brings us to, to this end of this episode. Hopefully, you found something new or useful while listening. If you did, throwing us a like would be greatly appreciated. 
If you want to make sure you don't miss any episodes, make sure you hit that subscribe button so you get notifications as soon as the next one drops. That really is one of the best ways to help a small channel like ours. We're currently on 818 subscribers and we're so close to that 1,000 subscriber number so we can get supported by, by YouTube. Uh, if you can't wait, you do want early access. We do have a Patreon where you get exclusive access to all of our content ahead of time. And as always, we'd love to hear your thoughts and feedback. So drop a comment below. We'll get right to you. Thank you so much for listening. I'm your host, Ryan. This has been Turning Point Tactics, and we'll see you next Tuesday. See you next Tuesday.